served since 2012. Today, he works to drive transformative innovation to save lives. Previously, Davis held positions at management consultant firm McKinsey & Company, Corbis, a large digital media company, and the Infectious Disease Research Bank. He is a member of several boards from Interaction and Challenge Seattle to being a trustee for the World Economic Forum's Global Health Challenge. Currently, Steve is a lecturer on social innovation and management here at the Stanford Graduate School. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Good afternoon or good evening. It's uh, really great to be here. I was in this series previously, and um, and they invited me back. I, mean, I guess I'm still somewhat impactful, but um, and it's also great to be at Stanford. Um, I uh, live in Seattle, where it was impossible to even see out of the car window. There was so much rain this morning coming down, so it's always fun to be here, where it's actually dry and um, great people and great energy. So I was asked today to speak a little bit about um, um, sort of not only the work I do and the work we're doing collectively to change the world, but a little bit about how I got here and sort of what that means to me and what I teach. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on my, on my story. I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I'll share with you some thoughts about my journey. Um, uh, a little bit of time about what I teach, and particularly I focus uh, on scaling social innovation and what that means and why that I think that's super important. And then a little bit about the company I run and what we're doing, and maybe you know. And then I'd really like to just open it up and answer questions or hear thoughts from you guys, um, and we'll get you out of here on time. So um, I know that's the most important. So. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I have a pretty complicated career, and it's really hard to understand. In fact, I gave a TEDx talk last week, and I was sort of joking about my mom still worries about, like, what am I going to be when I grow up, because <laughs> I've changed my career about six or seven times. So my first message to you guys is don't think you only can have one career in the world. There's, a, there's lots of ways to do things over the course of a, of, of a lifetime, and, and I hope I have more chances to do even more things. Um, and this is sort of a scattering of some of the things I've done from, you know, sitting on a lot of boards and helping start up a bunch of organizations, both social and for-profit, uh, and I've been somewhat of an entrepreneur through that period. I've also helped, I've taught here, I've taught at UW, I've done special uh, work um, around um, a number of projects around the world. Um, so it's sort of hard to describe, you know, uh, I'm best described as sort of a well, I was a religion major in college. I became a Chinese-speaking human rights lawyer, uh, doing a lot of work in that. I ended up becoming an internet pioneer in the early days, uh, a social entrepreneur and a consultant. Oh my God, I keep going downhill. And then, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, have been a number of roles as CEO, and I'm now a CEO of one of the largest um, NGOs in the world, um, uh, PATH, and I'll tell you more about them. But actually, the way I actually sometimes best describe my world is three different arcs in my life that, you know, kind of corresponded with historical arcs that I've just happened to ride the wave on. Um, and, and they're things that have changed in my lifetime and I've been part of, and they've been, it's, I've been very lucky to have been part of these. Um, I mean, one of the first things that I did when I was right out of college, and I did it because I, frankly, had a religion degree and didn't want to go to become a minister or anything. I just thought it was a cool thing to have a degree in. Um, so I went to Asia, and it was way back in the day. This was a long time ago. Um, and I went to China, and really early on, it was when China was, you couldn't even, we hadn't even recognized uh, mainland China at the time, and, and started um, learning a language, Living and traveling around Asia, I was just kind of hanging out, doing a lot of stuff. I was on a fellowship teaching, but but um, that actually has been a, a, a part of my life ever since. And I've uh, everything from I've studied at Beijing University. I when I was at McKinsey, I was working in Beijing in, uh, the, in, in a lot in China. I have adopted a Chinese child who's about you guys' age, a little older. Um, I have, um, uh, you know, a long history in China work. In fact, I'm recently um, uh, on the, the in the Beijing University's dialogue on the new um, uh, One Belt One Road policy, which is the Chinese policy on foreign. How do we get you know more foreign collaboration for global health and development in that work? So, 
Um, but it's an incredible, it's been an incredible arc for me, to, and I would sort of say there's a sort of a lesson there that ride the wave, right? What, what's the wave that's interesting in your world? But uh, I've learned a lot. And I think the China piece has always been uh, the part that has helped me become a global citizen. I think globally probably more than I think locally sometimes. I think about all the, the and you know, the experience of actually immersing yourself in another world at, at an early age. It's something I really strongly encourage um, students to do. The second arc um, that's changed dramatically in my lifetime was I was a gay kid in a little town in Montana Cowtown. I mean, where nobody was gay, nobody voted Democrat, nobody, I mean, it's a very conservative and uh, cowboy place. I, I was, uh, all my friends wore cowboy hats and that's what we did. And, and um, I, you know, ended up coming out later on in my work, I've done a lot of activism um, on, I was an, an AIDS activist in the 80s when friends were dying in New York. I was uh, uh, helped to find sort of our policy to move toward gay marriage and was a, you know worked on that globally, nationally and globally. Um, and you know have a and been married for 37 years to a man and have a child. And so I've been through a whole lot of change as the world has changed. And this has been a dramatic change in the last 40 years, where, in, in, at least in this country, and it's changing in other countries as well. But, but, um, but that was a defining piece of my life and continues to be, uh, but I don't spend a lot of time on the issue today, but it's, it's one that informed me in my thinking about rights, about discrimination, about activism, about engagement. And I find that's a really important um, part of the story. And then the third thing that happened to me, well, quite by accident, because I am literally the most klutzy technology person you can imagine. I can hardly, honestly, you know, know how to change batteries in a in a in, a, um, uh, in, in anything. Um, but I um, was asked early on at one point if I would come and help, uh, actually, Bill Gates think about. Um, this company he was thinking about starting outside of Microsoft and to work on uh, a new, uh, new technology around media and what would, we were then calling the information superhighway. So this was in the era before the internet was named um, and, and I got involved and I thought it sounded interesting. I told him I didn't know anything about technology and I knew nothing about business, but hey, why not? And, um, and, and, and I've been involved with technology ever since. So both in terms of managing a growing and a global internet company at one point, but also um, understanding sort of the life sciences side of it. So I also over, uh, was the chair of one of the large cancer centers and of course today run one of the largest global health organizations in the world. So, um, so technology has been a fascinating ride and I feel very lucky to have been um, part of, you know, learning about how to, um, innovate and how to think about innovation and how to um, take that work forward and make it um, meaningful and not only there's commercially meaningful which of course is where a lot of the business of, of, of technology goes but also how we can transform the world how we can shape better lives how we can actually build better systems and so um, that's that's really um, hardcore for me now as part of my DNA to think about technology and innovation so, so where does that lead? I mean, basically it leads me to um, kind of focus a lot on sort of moving away from my story to what I think about and teach and how I think people can be more impactful is I, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, these different influences have shaped my thinking about social innovation. And I use the term very broadly, but I think that um, there is such dynamic um, opportunity in the next 15, 20, 30 years when many of you will be able to make huge impact on the world to think about how we can actually change society and it can be on in terms of new educational models, new health models, um, addressing climate and planetary health or it can be, you know, shape helping your community, your neighborhood um, have safer streets. I mean, there, you can go from the big stuff to the small stuff or all over the place, but it is happening and the, the opportunity to do this today is great and greater than it's ever been. Um, so I, I came to Stanford a few years ago as I was asked to help on a project and I observed that on the, uh, the social innovation um, agenda here 
there was quite a bit of focus on early stage, on you know, what happens when people design stuff. And there's a focus on the D school with design and a lot of great user-centered models. There's a lot of work on you know, how do you start your social enterprise, how do you start a social... A star, it's a lot on the sort of first stage of it. And then there's actually a fair number of programs that are focused on, um, you know, where the, sort of the last mile delivery. So people, you know, there's a lot of tr the, the ways you can go and have spend a month in Ghana, or you can work in a inner city, and, and there's a lot of focus on that. The the challenge is there's a lot of work in between those two spots, in between the you know innovation garage or startup and the last mile. There's a huge amount of challenging work that makes the difference between you having an impact or not. And so, um, and so I've taken it on sort of as my work as a consultant uh, in, in, at McKinsey, but then beyond that in my teaching and my scholarship and my writing to start, you know, focusing on how do we bridge this, you know, so to, to accelerate or scale up social innovation. How do you go from a good idea, whether it's a cool product or a cool financing model or a new type of process innovation, and take it and get it to where it's affecting literally hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions of lives as possible, and really being disruptive and changing things. I kind of define social innovation pretty broadly. I think it's a little different than maybe the, the school's, um, GSP's uh, um, narrower focus, but I, I think it, you know, it has um, a quality of disruption. It, you know, an idea, a process, a technology that will disrupt the way work things or change the way things are happening. I think it's essential that its intention is to